Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this is the third attempt at making a table like this. The first two attempts ended in failure, and I didn't even end up publishing those videos, but this time I think I finally got it. This build started as a conversation with the guys from GL Veneer, and if you don't know who GL Veneer is, they are a massive wood supplier out of California, and while I have access to some amazing woods here locally, pretty much all of them are domestic species, where GL Veneer has woods from all over the world. So I went through their catalog and I landed on something called Mappa Burl. If you don't know, and I didn't know, Mappa Burl is actually a variety of poplar found mostly in France and Germany. And also if you're wondering how is my shop so big, did I finally get the warehouse of my dreams? No, I actually had to have this giant crate delivered to my wife's office because it was too big for my little shop. And the reason it's too big is because I didn't just get Mappa Burl. I also got that huge chunk of redwood that's gonna be for an upcoming video. I actually haven't even started on that redwood yet, but you'll probably see it leaning up in the back of my shop. There are some issues to working with this map of burl, and one of the big ones is that it's a very, very soft wood, and while it's technically considered a hardwood, it's actually softer wood than some softwood species, and if that's confusing, I can kind of oversimplify it this way. Softwoods are considered trees like pine trees, redwoods, dug firs, the ones with the needles, the hardwood species are the leaf trees, the broadleaf trees like maple and walnut and poplar. Not all hardwood species actually have wood that is harder than all softwood, if that makes sense. So this Mappa burl is actually softer than dug fir, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. In addition to being so soft, this particular Mappa was also very unstable, meaning it really wanted to warp and twist on me. So. After I got it flat, one of the very first things I wanted to do was get some C channels in it. I didn't want to give it any chance to move at all. And this particular slab was only about 1.4 inches thick or so, which is plenty thick for this desk that I'm building, but it's not really thick enough for the normal heavy duty C channels that I use. So I'm doing it a little bit different. I ended up buying these half inch thick C channels from Home Depot even. They were available in their metals aisle. I am Pretty sure I wildly overpaid opposed to going to an actual steel shop, but it was close and it was easy. So what I am doing here is I am routing out basically the entire thickness of the C-channel and I'll mount it upside down to how I normally do it. And this way the bolts, the C-channel, everything will be completely hidden. Lately, I normally buy my C-channels pre-made, but a couple years ago, I actually made a video on how to make your own C-channels and even how to make a jig to get them to fit perfectly every time. So if you want a little more info on these C-channels and how to inlay them, I will leave a link to that video in the video description. You wanna remember that the top of this slab is not the only part that's soft. The sides are also gonna be incredibly soft. So. If I was to attack the sides of this with an angle grinder and a wire wheel like I would with something like walnut, I would likely destroy that natural edge and lose all that awesome natural character. And you can see it is a slower process using these nylon wheels. This is my old Porter cable restore that has been discontinued, but it has a really nice non-marring nylon wheel on it. And you can start to see what I'm looking for, those natural little burl nubs that are just really, really cool. And the other nylon wheels I'm using, I just got from Amazon, they fit in my impact driver, and they do a really good job at preserving all that natural edge without really marring it much at all. You can see there are some faint lines from it, but I can't find a better tool than these nylon wheels. I will admit that I am probably better suited being the guy running the Caterpillar excavating for a mall parking lot than the archeologist who sits there for a week excavating the lower mandible of an extinct shrew or something like that. But you have to have a little bit of archeologist in you if you're gonna do this softwood live edge cleanup because it is a slow go and it takes quite a bit longer, but it is really, really necessary. And as hard as it was for me to take the time to get this right, it was definitely worth it in the end. At this point in the build, you might be thinking that this desk looks pretty similar to one of the desks I built a couple months ago and that was the Myrtle Wood Desk, which was some of the most incredible wood I've ever even seen, but it was also probably my most controversial build that I've ever done, and if you wanna know why it's controversial, I'll include a link in the video description to that build, but I assure you these desks are actually gonna end up wildly different, but one thing I did like about that one that I'm gonna keep on this one is adding this little 22 degree chamfer to the end, and 
I just tend to like these little beveled undercuts on the ends of these tables, even with the live edge. I think it's a little bit more interesting than just having a straight 90, but by no means is it necessary. Just something I kind of gravitate towards. Now, even though I went to all that work to preserve this natural edge, there is some practicality that needs to be observed, and that is just removing the very, very sharp points. And you can see just how sharp those little burl nubs are. So I wanted to make sure this wasn't gonna catch people's clothes or rip a hole in their sweater or take a toddler's eye out. And to do this, I just used a variety of my little rasps or sandpaper. And I, again, wanted to keep all the natural character I could without making it dangerous. And this is actually kind of a fun process. I don't look at this like the archeologist. This is kind of fun to get up there close and just try to keep it as natural as I can, but also remove all those little hazards. I have to admit, I am probably guilty of overlooking my Dremel tool, where it is, it is often the best tool for the job. Instead of just grabbing the Dremel, I instead reach for a spoke shave or a violin maker's rasp just because has a cool name and I probably overpaid for it. Instead, I could grab the Dremel, be done in a few seconds and have it look like this. Instead, I end up struggling with a tool because it has a fancy name. And I do need to remember to use that Dremel. I do love it. You can see just how good the results are when using it. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that I had tried a similar project to this a couple years ago and I failed. And the main reason that I failed in that particular instance was these little burl pits. It seemed like no matter what I did, I couldn't get them filled up. I tried epoxy and CA glue and all kinds of wood fillers and it just never looked right. And I certainly didn't think that desk was good enough to sell and I didn't even think it was good enough to turn into a YouTube video. So I just set it aside and didn't do anything with it. This time, I think I have a new solution to that burl pit problem. And some of you might've used this to but this was all the rage in like 2018 Instagram. And if I'm being honest, I kind of hate this stuff. I don't think it works very well. You can still feel it with your fingernail. It does sand, but it doesn't sand very well. And it just leaves kind of a poor texture. So I just don't think it's a very good product, at least for the high end items. However, since this one is gonna have an epoxy top coat on it anyway, it will negate any of that little texture that you feel there. And this rubbery substance actually does a really good job at filling the void. So this is all theoretical at this point, but we will see how it does. Now, I feel like I should give a disclaimer because anytime I say I don't like a product, there's always someone out there that says, I love that product and they think that I'm attacking them and their skills as a woodworker. And I promise you, it's not like that. I'm sure you're a good woodworker. It's just that the things you make probably aren't very good. After I spent a lot of time smoothing out all that rubbery hot glue stuff, there was still quite a few little pits left. And to fill these, I ended up going to the fill sticks. These are used in some kind of trim work. I had these left over from when I did my wood baseboards. And these you definitely wouldn't want to do with a finish like I normally do, like the Rubio Monaco, because these are really just kind of a harder wax. Whereas that rubbery stuff, it'll at least stay in there and kind of stand alone. But these softer sticks did a really good job at filling those really, really small pits. And the better job I can do here, the easier my next step's gonna be. So I spent a lot of time making sure each and every one of these pits was as filled as I could possibly get it. The look that I'm going for for this desk is kind of like the high-end PRS, Paul Reed Smith guitars, where they do this just crazy black dye job on these figured woods and since I don't think Paul Reed Smith would return my Instagram messages, I reached out to someone I do follow, Coca Guitars, and he's an incredibly talented, makes these beautiful guitars, and he had told me that I should use water for the bass for my dye, and before on that last one that I tried, I used alcohol, and it led to a bunch of kind of blotchy problems, so this is just regular tap water. This is what Coca said to do, and I thought it would have problems with the raised grain, but I really didn't, and you can see there's not really any problems with the lapping in that last one I did. I had horrible lap marks and what I'm doing here, the reason why I mixed up a couple batches is you apparently do one darker dye job first. So I'm going through with a very dark dye and this is made with the transient dye. It's the same dye I use in my epoxy tables. 
Then you come back and you sand it, and this removes that raised grain from the water, but what remains is kind of the deeper, darker pits. And the other jar that you saw me mix up there, that was a lighter dye. So you get this kind of, I don't know, cascading effect from the really dark to the medium dark, and it looks just incredible, or at least I'm hoping it looks incredible. It looks incredible on the PRS guitars, and that is the look that I'm going for, and that is how I achieved it so far. Another problem that I had with a different black ebonized table that I'd made even before that last one is I just did a single epoxy top coat on it and it led to horrible bubbles. And so through all of my epoxy experience over the last couple of years, I've learned a lot about sealing the wood. And what I'm doing here is I just kind of made some thinned out regular tabletop epoxy. And what this is gonna do is this is gonna seal up, penetrate that wood, and hopefully prevent any of those little micro bubbles from escaping because most people, when they do a tabletop epoxy, they don't seal it and it leads to just horrible little micro bubbles that they look okay from like 10 feet away, but if you get up close, it's just like almost a fog of little bubbles. So if I do a couple coats of this thinned out epoxy, it should seal this wood up nice and tight and prevent any of those bubbles. Some of you might be wondering what kind of client would commission this if you haven't successfully built one before. And this one isn't even for a client. This is one that I'm making just because I think it's really cool. I haven't really seen anything like it before in a desk. I think it's gonna be fun. I just really wanted to make this and I'm just gonna auction this off in the end. A couple months ago, we did an auction for the local Make-A-Wish Center and we raised $11,000. And I thought that was awesome. I thought it was a lot of fun. and. This time I'm gonna auction it off, I'll pay for shipping, I'll pay for a crate, at least in the domestic lower 48 United States. And the only difference is this time, I assure you, no good will be done with the money. So up to this point, I've done two coats of that thinned out epoxy that I just squeegeed off all the excess, came back with a sanding sponge just to knock down any little dust nibs. And now I'm gonna to try to make it as sterile as possible. I'm removing my fireplace fan because I don't want any air movement and here's another guitar trick that I've heard before is spraying the entire area with water so any dust that gets stirred up just lands in the water. And after that, I just clean the piece with a regular tack cloth like you might see in automotive work. Every time I do an epoxy top coat, I tell my wife I am never doing another epoxy top coat. And then a couple months later, I tell her that I'm struggling with an epoxy top coat. And she says, but I thought you weren't ever gonna do that again. And round and round the cycle goes. And here I am again using this tabletop epoxy. So this time I wanted to prepare a little bit. I talked to the guys at Super Clear Epoxy and got some tips and one really helpful tip for me was using a rubber glove like that to spread it out. They said use the pizza sauce method where you pour a little bit in the middle and you just spread it out with your hands. And the warmer you can get that epoxy within reason, the better it's gonna self level. And you can see here, it's not great. I still have some pits left and I knew it wasn't gonna be perfect after the first coat, but I'm hoping after maybe two or three, I can get it right. One of the only successes I've had doing tabletop epoxy is that burnt wood table I did a couple years ago. And one of the reasons that worked pretty well is I was able to warm the table itself up using the sun. And when I put the epoxy on it, it just really leveled nicely. And even with my fireplace here, it's barely above 60 degrees, so it's not wanting to self-level that well. You can warm it up with a torch like I'm doing here or even a heat gun. Then you just worry about dropping hairs and little dust nibs into it. So it's always a challenge, but I'm getting a little bit closer. You can see it's better than the first coat, but we still have a long ways to go. Even though it is not very flat just yet, I think it's close enough that if I do an excellent job prepping it, I can get it all on that next epoxy top coat. And to start with that, I'm gonna be using this 320 sandpaper. And this is my new favorite sandpaper. This is not sponsored, this is by 3M Extract. I've been using it for everything. And sanding epoxy like this with normal sandpaper is a complete nightmare. It clogs instantly and leaves horrible pigtails. But this extract just does an amazing job. And I generally hate block sanding, but when I'm doing the end grain like this, I didn't want to burn through that epoxy and then hit my color, making it look completely ridiculous. So I used the block sander and just smoothed out all those high points. I was about to wipe this down with just some random denatured alcohol I had sitting on one of my shelves, and I reached out to my contact at Super Clear Epoxy and was like, hey, 
what's the best thing for wiping down epoxy before a flood coat? And he said, only ever use above 90% isopropyl alcohol. Don't use anything else. And I was like, oh, glad I asked. So if you're wondering, clean your pieces with above 90% isopropyl alcohol, which I was able to get at Walgreens. For this final coat, I warmed the epoxy up in just a warm water bath to about 85 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Mixed it up carefully. I didn't use a paddle mixer or anything like that. That'll whip too many bubbles into it. And then I just came and did that pizza sauce method of just smoothing it out best I can. Really hoping I could self level it out with a little bit of assistance from the torch and at least was able to pop all those bubbles. I still have a lot of work to do on the top, but before I get to the buffing process, I'm gonna attach the leg so I don't scuff up that top while attaching these. And I haven't been this excited about a set of metal legs in a long time. These I found from a guy in New Zealand. They are custom cast aluminum. They're solid aluminum and they have a high polish on the outside. And I have a grand reveal at the end. You'll see plenty of looks at these legs, but they're like a Terminator leg or something from Westworld. Super cool, super modern, just different than anything I've done before. So I took a chance. I want to do something different. This top is already wildly different. So I wanted legs that would really highlight just kind of how wild and modern this tabletop is. That last epoxy flood coat actually went pretty well, except for two little hairs that landed at two different spots. And at this point, I didn't realize how much of an impact those little hairs were going to be because I ended up having to go all the way down to 600 grit sanding. I was hoping to go right into 1500 grit sanding, but to get those hairs all the way removed, I had to remove quite a lot of material, which leads to a much larger problem. And so before you lose all respect for me, I should probably ask for your subscription now before you actually see that mistake. So if you've enjoyed this video, if you've learned what to do, what not to do, or if you've just enjoyed watching me struggle through this project, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button right now, if you think that I've earned it, just don't hit unsubscribe once you see that mistake that I made. I suppose I should give a hint at what the problem is that comes up in a minute or two. And the hint is this, I am sanding at 600 grit here, and then I'm gonna move on to 800 grit, then 1500 grit, then 3000, and then the automotive compounds. And I am the first one to say that I am not great at buffing out these clear coats, kind of this automotive style finishing, but I'm always trying to get better. And one of the ways you can get better is listening to people that are smarter than you. And in that fire table build I did, I did the same kind of buffing process. And I got a lot of comments from automotive guys telling me that I should try this 3M Trizact system. And it actually is a really, really good system. The stuff works amazingly well if you go through the proper steps. And that's again, kind of a hint at the problem that comes up. And you can see there, that's what it looks like with 1500 grit. I'm not using the vacuum on my sander if you're wondering. And here is the 3000 grit, which is just really soft. It's not quite leather smooth, but you can see it actually cuts remarkably well, which is hard to believe for a 3000 grit to be able to cut through that clear coat that well. As flashy as this table is getting, I am generally the opposite of flash. The only piece of jewelry I have ever owned is a basic tungsten wedding band, and it's about as flashy as you would expect. So when a ring company emailed me about sponsoring a video, they almost ended up in the spam folder because as much of a sellout as I am, I actually turned down way more sponsorships than I take. I ended up browsing Thorm's rings though, and they're just cool, normal rings at basically cool, normal prices. Like my ring, most are made from tungsten, which is crazy durable, but unlike my ring, they have options with redwood accents or World War II rifle stocks, even meteorite. My wife told me I can't exchange my ring for a new one, but this is the exact type of ring I would purchase if I was doing it again. And let's pray I never actually have to do it again though. Oh, Thorm even gives a free silicone band with every purchase, which is something I should probably be wearing in the shop too. I don't know if anybody else can relate to that look that I'm giving the table right there, but for me, it's the same look you give your brand new car when you come out of the grocery store and you see a giant door ding one day after buying it. You know it's there, you can see it, but you feel like you need to get your face about two millimeters away to actually believe it. And yes, it is there. All right, that was really unfortunate. And if you missed what happened is I didn't do a good enough job sanding it. Probably at that 800 grit level, when I jumped all the way from 800 to 1500, that was a little bit too big of a jump and I suspected it might be, and I went ahead and I did it anyway. So what I have to do now, I'm gonna go back down to the 800, probably go 800, 1,000, maybe 1,200, then 1,500, then 3,000, 
then get the compounds again, buff it all the way out, and I'm actually out of that compound too, so I gotta go buy some compound, probably buy some sandpaper, and it's just part of the process, so hope you enjoy watching me struggle like this. Don't worry, I won't make you watch the entire sanding process again. I did go down to the 800 grit, but this time I did what I should have done the first time, and that's got the inspection light out and really, really combed over it between grits because this is what you need to do to make sure you don't have problems like that where you don't skip grits, go too far, and have to do the whole thing over again. And I will show you what it looks like after the stage one, which is pretty good. That's a nice shine, but we can get it even shinier than that. And if I didn't mention, I'm using the 3M Perfect It kit. It's a really cool kit and it buffs out really well, even for guys that don't know what they're doing. And I have one more thing to give it even a little bit more shine. You can see there's already an obscene amount of shine on this table and to get a little bit more sheen, a little bit more luster, a little bit more contrast, but more importantly protection, I'm gonna add the Black Forest Ceramic Coating and that's gonna give us that kind of invisible clear coat that's gonna be the additional layer of protection when we're sliding our papers and our cans and our drinks and things like that that will really, really protect this shiny clear coat. I've been using this Black Forest Ceramic on my hard wax finish tables for about a year or so and it works really, really well but this ceramic was invented to be used on automotive clear coats. This is where it's designed to be used. So this is an even better use of this ceramic coating on something with a clear coat like this because as awesome as these clear coats are, they can be prone to scratching because it's like you know the hood of your car. If you slid your dinner plate across a bunch, you would put some scratches in that clear coat. So providing this extra barrier of protection is gonna really help prevent any of those little micro scratches. And the reason there's two coats is that first coat, as I'm told, is actually harder than the second coat, which sounds counter, but this, quote, softer top coat will bend, not break, on like a molecular level. So as you're sliding your cups across it or sliding t things across this clear coat, that upper layer on a molecular level, again, will bend and not break and show those scratches. So it's some really cool technology that goes into it, and it really ups the luster, too. I have really enjoyed building this project. It's something that I've wanted to do for a long time and I am thrilled with how it came out. So I am putting this up for auction with no reserve. There's an eBay link in the video description. So if you wanna buy this, you can put your bid in the link below. If you're one of the people that happens to root against me, I'll leave that link up forever so you can see how good or bad I did because I will pay for shipping across the lower 48. Anybody can bid on it, but you'll have to pay for shipping if you're outside of the lower 48. And Every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So start your question or comment with the word MAPPA and I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video.